Welcome to Mindscapes, a series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, visions, and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is one of India's distinguished poets. Writing in English, he's had a vast repertoire of work, both as a poet and as a writer of short fiction. He's been lauded and applauded around the world with the Commonwealth Poetry Prize the highest literary honor in India, the Sahitya Academy Award, and has been included relatively recently in the Penguin Collection of 20th Century Poets with distinguished writers as T.S. Eliot, W.H. Auden, C.S. Lewis, and not to mention Bob Dylan and the Beatles. I'm delighted to welcome Keki Darawala. Thank you. You have been um, writing and, and, and since really the early uh, 70s, have been instrumental in, in carving out this niche for Indian writers, uh, Indian writing in English. You're an Indian writing in English, and uh, yet uh, your um, sensibility is, 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 is global. I, I don't mean purely in the sense that you know, there are values that are universal or what have you, but much of your writing is located uh, in, in contexts and cultures uh, outside India. Uh, it's not just limited uh, to India. So in a sense that while there is the Indian sensibility, which is in a sense universal, but it's also located in other sensibilities and other cultural contexts. Where was this sort of universality, in a sense, born, bred of? Uh, well, I think it comes from the written word. You read a lot. Uh, you read your, when I was uh, a kid, my father read out the Shahnama to me. Now that will remain an influence, you know. Uh, then you went into Western literature. But I must say that my first two books were totally rooted in the Indian landscape, uh, in the Indian ethos. And in fact, I started getting uh, criticisms from people that he's a poet of the Tarai and the, the northern, uh, northern Indian belt, you know, the UP belt, because I, I was in UP all, half, more than half my life. Uh, so that, I, I think it's the word, the written word, the spoken word, which comes through, and what you read. And since I could only read in English, so it's Western literature, a little of Western philosophy, not much, a lot of Western history, uh, that went into one's making. You've, you know, you've located a novella in, in Latin America, you've got, yes. you know, <laughs> you're sort of extremely, uh, you know, moved by, you know, what happens in the Middle East, and, and it's, 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 it's truly international uh, in, in, in that sense. And, and, and the poetic vision is seen as being intensely personal in some ways. Uh, has this been a, a self-conscious attempt to locate this outside? No, no, not really. I, I think it's uh, just the fascination with the Middle East, possibly because of the Persian roots and a lot of Persian history that I read. I've read my Herodotus uh, quite often and the Shah Nama, plus a lot of books on Iran and Iraq. Uh, politically also, I was a sort of a analyst, so the Middle East has been under my uh, sort of gaze for quite a while. And the Latin American connection came with, I mean, if you read Borges or if you read Marquez and the Hundred Years of Solitude, I mean, the new, and the Vallejo and all, all the rest, you know, Naruda and the rest, uh, then you can't help uh, getting absolutely entranced with what, what happens in South America and the coups and the uh, Zapatistas and, you know, the, the whole works. And uh, I've never been to South America, I've never been to Central America. But I located the novella there, especially because it uh, dealt with uh, di dictatorships. And you have uh, novels by Alejo Carpentier. And as also, of course, the, uh, uh, the, the, no the famous novel by Marquez. So I thought, well, it was an imitation. And imitation, I think, is the highest compliment you can pay to some of your idols. 
when we describe a poet, and, 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 and that in some senses is your primary identity, um, a poet is not someone who just writes poetry. It, it, it refers to a, a sensibility. Uh, how were you able to reconcile, or did it need reconciling, uh, that sensibility with some of the other things that you that you did in your life, you know, such as being, uh, you know, working for the research and analysis wing and, and, and retiring as, as a secretary, really? And and the earlier years with the police, I have been asked this uh, uh, most of my life, you know. <laughs> uh, I don't think you needed too much of reconciliation. Uh, I thought whatever uh, power, whatever little power my poetry had, the, the first few volumes, came from my contact with the grassroots. I, I was a sort of a rural policeman in the sense that I was in small districts and by the time I got senior enough for, you know, the big cities, uh, I came into in intelligence. So I don't think, uh, uh, I, I never held big charges as such, but the grassroots contact, and that makes a lot of difference. You, you are going somewhere in the Tarai and you find uh, two people carrying a sick man, you know, uh, on a stretcher or, or li literally on a cart. And a poem like uh, Pestilence uh, came, out, came out of it, you know, I saw two uh, ep epileptic fall from a rickshaw while having a walk. I was having a walk and he, this man fell and a, a poem on the epileptic uh, came through. So a lot of them were sort of, you know, you just see, you're an observer, you're, they are camera shots. Uh, but uh, I thought that gave me a lot of contact with the, with the grassroots as I keep repeating. And if I had been an academic writing poetry, and you will normally see whether it's a Spanish poet or a, a Portuguese poet or a Greek poet, most of them come from the universities. Now, they often write about writing as well. Uh, I didn't have that to start with, and that gave, uh, gave me a sort, of a, uh, sort of an advantage. And I, as far as the sensibility is concerned, I don't think uh, much reconciliation was, was needed. Uh, the job you do, and if you are a banker or if you are an insurance agent, I don't know. I think that's more soul killing than having been a policeman or having been an analyst uh, with uh, with an intelligence organization. In what ways has uh, you know the fact that you were an Indian writing in English? You have described this as as a half caste mistress. Uh, the language you have yes. uh, you, know, you talked about how uh, you know sort of. Uh, slang in, 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 in the language find their way in, into classical dictionary. Um, in what ways has, 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 has the texture, the processes of, of writing and the language uh, affected your uh, sensibility? Again, I go back to that word uh, because uh, you are using a language uh, which is not just writing about um, Indians who speak English, but you're using that language to, to project a much larger, wider range of of processes and then articulations. So what is the creative tension that happens between them? You see, the Indian poet writing in English uh, suffers from a handicap vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Indian writing in fiction. When you write fiction, you speak the way we speak, you know, half English, half Hindi or Hindustani. You mix up the words and, you know, you'll say things like, oh, this went put and, you know, you know that kind of uh, Indianese or whatever you call it, or English as you call it. Uh, when you are writing poetry, somehow you have to be almost, you, you have to uh, use textual English, literally. Uh, you do take liberties sometime or the other, but not too much because, uh, for, for instance, Nisim Ezekiel tried, you know, goodbye party to Miss Pushpa, etc., etc. And uh, they, they, in a way they have failed. In a way they have succeeded, but in a way they have failed. Uh, and we didn't go uh, that route, you know. We, we, we stuck to, uh, most of us by we, I mean, you know, Partha Sarthi and Kamla Das and me and all the rest of us. We, we stuck, stuck to uh, textual, textual English. Uh, and that, uh, that restricts you. That does restrict you because that's not exactly 100% uh, the language that you speak. So you get tensions and you uh, get uh, slight fits of depression sometimes, using the language the way you do. But uh, 
there is no other way out. At least I didn't see a way out. I suppose the younger generation will see a way out. I, it, it, I was also referring in, uh, to uh, the, earlier, the earlier, earlier question, really, that uh, some of your fiction writing has been located outside uh, the context uh, of, of India. Uh, and, and, and you're really reporting, writing about processes of an unfolding of a narrative where you cannot fall back on the, the sort of Indian English, as it were, because that's a more neutral kind of uh, uh, language uh, that you need to use. So how, how difficult, how challenging of, was it transplanting that? There aren't many Indian writers in English who have attempted to locate the narratives outside the context of India. I don't have many, many uh, stories uh, uh, located outside India, but the ones I have, I'm, I'm rather fond of them. And I take them, uh, I ta take it as a challenge, you know. And uh, th that makes it exciting. Uh, otherwise, you locate everything in the Indo-Gangetic plane. Uh, that makes it, um, uh, after, after a while, you get, you feel stifled, uh, almost claustrophobic. So I try to venture out. And there are some plots. I mean, a plot also comes to you. Uh, you, you don't uh, think of it uh, too mechanically. You don't uh, develop plots. Uh, they, they come to you, at least. And as you keep writing, they, they sort of unfold th themselves. Uh, that's what happen, happens in poetry as well. Uh, it happens in fiction more with me. But uh, that is the challenge, and that is the excitement one is looking forward to. If one doesn't do that, uh, writing becomes a bit dull. I, I was, I'm midway, I'm, last year has been a very bad year for me personally, in my personal life, so that's different. But otherwise, I was working on a novel in the days of Vasco da Gama, you know. And I'll have to locate a part of it outside, outside India, because if I um, locate everything when Vasco da Gama comes to the Zamorin, uh, I think it'll be. It won't be what I'm looking for. I, I, I want the culture of the 16th century to come in. I want the uh, Mamluks and the Ottomans, you know, <coughs> fighting it out. And fortunately, there was an Arab pilot to Vasco da Gama. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of that, and I'm <coughs> locating him in Cairo or somewhere else. I, I mean, that, that's a sort of a challenge. Uh, so I had to read a lot of Egyptian history, and I stayed in Egypt for about uh, less than a month. My daughter was there, uh, and I picked up my materials. You said the, the last year has been difficult uh, for you. I don't wish to probe that. Um, in, 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 in what ways do the sort of uh, the difficulties, the challenges? No, I, uh, I had a life? personal tragedy. That's it. In, in, in what ways? Uh, the question is: is in, in what ways is 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 is, is the difficulties of life? Uh, the challenges, um, uh, catalysts for you, uh, for uh, producing. Mm, well, uh, this was this one was not a catalyst because it uh, knocked me out for a year. Uh, but uh, what you have to do is uh, not to give in to your moods. I now, for example, I uh, there's a lot of uh, melancholic, uh, pensive writing as it is in my um, uh, in my writing. I I don't want the moods to get to me. I've written a few personal poems after that. It was my wife died in an accident last year. That's why I'm mentioning this. Uh, but uh, I, I wouldn't like to go into any melancholic writing. I'll, I'll keep the mood optimistic, uh, and I'm sure I'll succeed. Is suffering a catalyst for, for, for literature, for creativity, for a lot insight? Of, uh, a lot of people believe that cliche. I don't. I mean, I, I've known of Indian professors going to uh, for example, in Singapore, I was told, uh, they, they said that an uh, Indian professor came and he said, you will never have great literature in, the, in Southeast Asia. Those were the days when the, the, the economy was booming there. And he said, because you, you've never suffered. I think that's uh, a lot of nonsense. Uh, and I, I don't think uh, suffering necessarily. We, we've all got that from the Russian novelists of the 19th century and Thomas Hardy and all the rest. Uh, but I don't think uh, it necessarily is a catalyst. Mm -hmm. To what degree is the process of writing or the process of creating, creating something uh, exhilarating, painful, a struggle? How do, how do you react to that process? I think it's uh, a struggle to start with and exhilarating at the end of it if you are satisfied with what you've written. How often are you satisfied with what you've written? <laughs> <laughs> That's a moot question. What uh -huh. shall I say? 40 percent, 30 percent. Yes, and uh, sometimes you'll, you feel, well, you know, chalega. Uh, 
and sometimes you actually feel that yes you got hold of something good and you have done a good job of it that comes seldom 20% 25% you have been included in this in this uh, uh, in, in in collections of poetry at least that that place you in in, in the league of, well, of yes, the world's best but, in the 20th yeah. century yes uh, you you have also s sort of uh, commented that uh, writing poetry in some ways is is like getting a, a, a blood clot out of, of, of the bloodstream uh, you know that sense of, of release of, of something that's brewing and then uh, comes out and, 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 and relief of uh, the relief of catharsis um, what what is this the sort of the the, the impetus the impulse for a for a poem uh, a story uh, you know that, 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 that finds concrete physical expression manifestation what is this blood clot waiting to get out uh, uh, one is obviously talking of intensity here and you get the idea I, d I am very chary of using the word inspiration I uh, inspiration comes to I suppose better writers uh, I'm talking of just the idea striking you and then getting hold of you slowly you know and uh, uh, you you explore your yourself uh, through the idea through that first impulse and when you think you have come out with your story or with your with your poem uh, there is a great sense of relief uh, it's only uh, the the climb down comes when you read the same piece a few days later and you feel that you have uh, you've been led down somewhere or the other because you're never fully fully satisfied but then you read it again after two months and you feel well uh, things are okay and that's the kind of uh, look back you have uh, where your own writing is concerned to what degree is, is, is the process of articulation yes. uh, driven by your need to identify, to discover for yourself the, you know, the core of, an, of, a, of a feeling, of a sensation, of an idea? Uh, and, and, and to what degree is it uh, an effort to communicate? You see, the, uh, the core is not people. articulate when, you, when the idea hits you. you. Never fully articulate in the sense you, you get a seed and then you explore and there are times especially when you're writing fiction when you could go anyway you, you, you know you could go uh, right you could go left and then somehow you choose one particular part or you are driven into one particular track and the thing comes out I still remember uh, we had a reading on A.K. Ramanujan his poems are pre uh, the the finest Indian poet uh, who was written in English about that I have no doubt and I, I read his poems out and I came back and in the car I thought of a poem and then when I sat down on the computer it turned out to be a totally different poem and I forgot what I had been uh, thinking of in the car I had almost a poem full you know when you are driving incidentally I uh, when I'm driving or I'm in a train or in a on a plane uh, uh, the writing comes easier to me than it does elsewhere, which is quite surprising. Have you, have you sort of wondered why? I have never wondered why. Well, is it uh, the, the <laughs> process of, of the of, physical of travel? Motion, of movement, the propulsion or, uh, movement, possibly. Of, of isolation in some senses? Yes, uh, yes, possibly. Now you, you, you write poetry and fiction, and, and we've really been talking about that, and, and, and you are um, sort of enormously applauded for that. But you also write on, on, on con contemporary events and on, yes. on, on current affairs as, 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 as as you know, in, 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 in the um, popular press, shall I put it? Yes. Um, you have written extensively uh, on Kashmir, and that has been an area of, of interest. Uh, Kashmir is the buzzword as, as, as we record this. And I was reading one of your pieces in which you'd said, well, uh, you know, what is the point of dialogue uh, unless we really have something new or significant to offer uh, than the traditionally held positions? Pakistan, uh, Kashmir is an integral part of India. Da, 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 da. Um, you have been working uh, with, with, with the intelligence agencies. Uh, you, are, you, you must have some sense of, of uh, what is it that India might, in fact, concretely, tangibly, uh, be able to one day uh, offer in Kashmir. I don't think we have much to offer. You see, that, that is the whole point of it. Uh, I mean, uh, for Pakistan, it's easy to claim the whole thing. Uh, they talk about the partition agenda. They have no agenda with China. 
they very happily ceded, I don't know how many thousand square kilometers, you know, to China. They never talk about it in 1963. And uh, with us, I think the status quo as it is, as Farooq Abdullah repeats himself so very often, uh, that is the answer. Otherwise, the, the nation can never accept, uh, let's say, an uh, amalgamation of Ladakh and an amalgamation of uh, Jammu into India and some sort of a uh, protectorate status for the valley or something of the kind. I suppose uh, there was a time I used to dream of it, uh, Himalayan Republic of uh, Tibet, you know, and a Himalayan Republic of uh, Kashmir or something with uh, some UN. I, but I don't think it will ever, uh, no, th neither India. India will, of course, never accept it, and the Indian people will never accept it. And I suppose uh, the Pakistanis have uh, built themselves up through uh, the rhetoric, you know, 50 years of rhetoric, uh, that they are not going to accept it. So it's going to be as futile. Any, any solution, uh, this kind of a solution, uh, is going to be as futile as the present state uh, status is. That's why I, I, I really feel very pessimistic on Kashmir. And what was your response, and uh, now sort of more as a citizen of India than, than, than someone sitting there in, uh, in, in, in the corridors of power, uh, to, to the recent uh, summit in Agra? Uh, I thought it was a missed opportunity, but I, I, I wish we had played it differently. Mm -hmm. I wish ways? it had not been a state visit, you know, with all the banquets and the receptions and the guards of honor. Uh, it should have been a working visit. Uh, without all the pomp and the panoply of a uh, presidential visit, uh, that would have also uh, been uh, even morally, uh, you know, the man who attacked us in Kargil or a man who took over as uh, president and overthrew a democratic system. Uh, why do we have to give, uh, you know, th this kind of a, have, have a, this kind of a reception for him? That was firstly my view. Uh, secondly, we shouldn't have, uh, we, this was a summit through the media. The media, I th I'm sorry to say, should have been kept at bay, at bay. I mean, otherwise, uh, all the statements were coming through the media. And uh, that televised conference, uh, I think we showed a little bit of peak at that televised uh, conference of uh, President Musharraf. Uh, we needn't have shown it. And uh, possibly an invitation to him to hang on for a day. Uh, and we might have had a draft. But there I want to put another thing uh, and say another thing in the sense that our whole emphasis was on words. You know, words were a substitute for reality. I mean, if uh, you go back and the next day the, the war starts, actually I'm told the day President Musharraf landed, uh, there were 30 violations of, of the ceasefire line and the, uh, of the uh, LFC uh, that very day. So. Where, uh, where is the point in an agreement where uh, two uh, leaders have signed if nobody is going to abide by that agreement? So uh, I thought uh, we, it was more a question of words, semantics. Uh, I was not impressed. As a poet, and, and we talked about the, the, the sensibility of a poet, and we normally sort of associate uh, a poetic sensibility with a, with a heightened degree of sensibility uh, sensitivity, the potential for, uh, for pain, for, for suffering, for anguish, some of more than uh, people. How does the poet in you uh, look at uh, what is happening uh, in Kashmir and what might happen uh, in the foreseeable future? Uh, I look at it through a very uh, depressive prism and uh, uh, it's no, uh, the moment you look at uh, Kashmir, uh, you, you, you feel considerably depressed, that's all I can say. I mean, there is, at the moment, not much light at the end of the tunnel. And that's sad. Could I sort of in, 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 in invite you in conclusion? Uh, you have, uh, you, you're on record as saying that you don't uh, uh, memorize your poems, you don't rem remember your poems, you, you're able to recite more from uh, uh, Frost and, 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 yes. and other poems, poets you admire than your own poetry. Yes. Um, would you give us a, 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 a piece of your poetry uh, that, that uh, sort of represents you as, uh, shall we say, an epitaph to this program? What would oh, you Thank you. Use? I'd love to read something. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
I'll read a poem called The Fool. I wrote it for children to start with, but uh, I thought it uh, would. I included it in a book. I have written for children, a book for children, poems, uh, but I thought it would go for adults as well, and it's on the birth of a fool. The fool. Always when the fool is born, night is over, it is dawn. Here the night is grey and young, the stars crawl upwards, rung on rung. The first gold field of splintered glass, the dew condensing on the grass. In store for them is freezing cold for the mother mare and coming foal. A bed of straw is snugly laid, sheaf on sheaf and blade on blade. The farmhand sees through creaking door, her hooves turn restless on the floor. She circles round but doesn't groan, a restless stammer on the stone. Then she lies down on the straw, the foal has started booming now. Soon a bag, toy horse and blood lie gently heaving in the mud. Four thin twig-like legs appear to sign the end of this dark year. For quite some time the legs don't kick, the foal awaits the mother's lick. Where's the dark and where's the cold? The mother's steam breath warms the foal. Slowly the eyes are licked quite clean and sight appears through web screen. Always when the foal is born, night is over, it is dawn. This represents uh, a feeling of, uh, of, of, of renewal, of uh, beginnings. It does. Why do you choose that as an, as an epitaph to a program? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, well, you, you're looking ahead. You're looking ahead rather than looking backwards. That's how it is. And, and, and looking ahead uh, for yourself, uh, what are you? What is your principal dream? Uh, well, one is to finish my two or three novels, which I have got in my, you know. Goodness, two or three novels at the yes, same time? Yes, brewing. because they're, they're uh -huh. brewing for the last 20 or 30 years, but I haven't had the time to write them. And the other is a book uh, which I could have almost finished in 1992 or 93. I was writing on the, uh, the Persian, a uh, uh, book of poems on the Persian and the Greek wars. You know, I'd been asked to write a book on the Parsis, and I went into the early Persian history. I'm not a scholar, so I could never write on the Parsis. And instead, these poems came out. So I have to just finish them, and I'll have a decent poetry book. Thank you, Dr. Rana. We shall be waiting to applaud. Thank you very much. Thank you.